Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Origin Story, where we dive into the stories of how your favorite YouTubers built their channels. I'm Mike. And I'm JP, and we're joined by Crafted Workshop. What's going on, guys? Johnny Brook is the man behind the channel, Crafted Workshop. Johnny is a woodworker and craftsman living in Asheville, North Carolina. He is also an avid mountain biker, brewer, and family man. His channel focuses on showing the DIYer how to accomplish projects like laying tile, creating a miter saw station, and building amazing furniture. His 213 videos have been watched over 61 million times and built a community of over 850,000 subscribers. If you're lo looking to build some furniture or tackle a home project, check out his channel for some amazing inspiration and how to's. Also, visit his website, and download some projects, uh, project plans, and buy some merch because you know we got to we got to promote the merch there. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Johnny. It's going to be a great one. Yeah, dude, excited to be on. It just it's before we fun. start, like we were talking before we started recording. This has been one year in the making. I'm super super <laughs> excited about this. Life is this crazy thing, and congratulations on your second child. Um, really, really excited for that, uh, and I, I thank you so much. Really, it's it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's definitely been a crazy year. Let me tell you, it's uh, building a building a house in your backyard and having a second kid that that'll keep you pretty busy. Yeah, and and the other eight hundred and fifty things. That you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. A lot of projects and pieces that are tacked onto those projects. You know, it, it's never ending, but it's it's amazing that this is my life. You know, I get to work for myself, do what I want, and I don't know, keeps yeah. me happy. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Um, we're excited to talk a little bit about what got you here. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just to dive in, just to start, talk a little bit about your past. Um, you know, one thing we, we noticed, you know, we heard from you is that your mom was a master gardener, right? So you have all, art is kind of infused in everything you do. Love for music, love for projects, kind of this design thing. You're just going at it at a bit of a different medium. Um, where did that passion for art really start from? You know, it's interesting. Like I, my dad also is woodworker. I, I kind of grew up a little bit around some woodworking stuff, you know, like remember definitely watching like this old house and things like that with him when I was a kid. So I think that kind of creative aspect has always been in our house, whether that's music or, you know, my mom loving being outside and, and, and gardening and, and doing her thing. And my dad having his little projects going on. It's, it's kind of always been something that's there. And I think they really encouraged us to kind of have our own interests and in, in hobbies and things like that. So I, I know for me personally, the thing that I was passionate about from very early on was computers. And so that kind of led to, you know, my discovery of a lot of music type stuff. Cause when I was growing up, that was like, I remember getting a CD burner in sixth grade. And that was like my, my big present was like the $300 CD burner. And that was when Napster was like super hot. So I was like making mixtapes for my friends and, you know, charging them like a dollar or whatever. So <clears throat> yeah, I don't know, just having the internet at my fingertips growing up was, I mean, it was it's hugely in, influential, obviously, because I, I could research anything I wanted and, and get into any hobby I wanted. And I think that's kind of been a, a continuous thing for me. I'm a serial hobbyist. I, I have way too many hobbies probably and you know it's kind of like a running joke among my friends and family that I'm always kind of getting into something new and uh, it's, it's just always been really fun to learn about new things and you know having the access to that information is just amazing so you know kind of when I started to get older and, and get into things like like woodworking and things like that having all of that information out there for free was amazing. And to be able to learn all that stuff and, and, and watch other people who were hugely influential for me, it just, I don't know, it's, it's a really cool time, I think, to, to be alive, to, to have all this information at your fingertips, yeah. totally free. When you were, so when you were a kid and your, your parents were pretty active in all this woodworking and, you know, what, gardening, whatever, um, you know, they might've been doing, was this stuff that you kind of just did as like, did you help them out as like chores when you were growing up or did it, you know, and then you kind of just picked up and learned from there? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, my brother and I both definitely had our fair share of, of garden and lawn uh, duties as part of, you know, the household chores. Yeah. Definitely spent plenty of time with a pickaxe digging holes for, you know, new shrubs that my mom was putting in or, 
you know, mowing the lawn. I, I had a lawn care business in high school, like a little, you know, a handful of lawns that I would use my parents' lawn equipment and yeah, take it to like, top and walk yeah, it down like, the street. Yep. It was ridiculous because they were paying for all of the maintenance and gas and stuff. And I was just, you know, basically cruising around in my truck with the, with the riding lawnmower. But um, yeah. I, that's I a heck know, of a business it, model though. I mean, that's it was all great. <laughs> Man, as a teenager, I was like, yeah, this is cash money. You know, it was, uh, it was great. And I had a truck that had terrible gas mileage. So I needed every bit of it. So yeah, it, uh, I, so yeah, I think part of it was just growing up in that environment. I mean, I know like, I don't think I was really into like woodworking per se back then, but like I was big into skateboarding. And so I wanted to build a skateboard ramp. And so when I wanted to do that, you know, like I had the tools available and, and things like that. Um, you know, my wife and I were in apartments for a number of years with her going to grad school and kind of moving around and stuff. So woodworking is not super viable when you live in an apartment. So I, I think there were definitely a number of years where that wasn't something I was into. And that's, I think, really when I got into like homebrewing and, and you know, all of the things that were related to Crafted Magazine back then, because, you know, having a wood shop in a thousand square foot apartment and outside of Boston, not really uh, super <laughs> possible. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I've always just been interested in in learning new things. And I think especially things that are kind of mechanically uh, related, you know, whether that's like, I worked at a bike shop for a couple of years in college and got super into mountain biking and, you know, tearing down bikes and building up bikes and buying and selling and all that kind of stuff. So I think for me, if a hobby doesn't have a lot of gear to go along with it, then I'm probably not going to be very interested in that hobby. <laughs> like it's, it's got like, even I remember like in like fifth grade, I was, I got really into fishing. And so I bought a lot of fishing stuff, but then I went fishing and I hated fishing. So <laughs> then I got out of it, but like, just like getting the Bass Pro Shops catalog and looking at all the lures and, and the reels and all that stuff was super cool to me, but <laughs> the wow. actual act of fishing didn't really appeal to me very much. So I think that's like the common thread is it's got to have some gear around it. Like yeah. you got to love the gear. Yeah. And then like, you know, when you're younger, then you just love to research it. You're like, Oh, you oh yeah. Catalog in. You go through it all. I mean, yeah. yeah, I love that. That's kind of like, well, you talked about music. It's like, you know, that's, Oh you yeah. Do all the research to find new artists and go through that and, you know, learn, learn from there. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and even like, you know, going to guitar center as like a, seventh grader with no money i'm like looking at all these instruments and effects pedals and amps that i'll never be able to afford you know and it's just it's funny thinking back to those times because i would just spend hours and hours just you know researching all that stuff and i had my little my little line six combo amp you know that i was trying to squeeze every good sound out of but uh you know i, I think it really teaches you that money isn't everything and once you know once you become an adult you might have a lot of stuff but you don't have any time to use that stuff. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a funny balance there. So I want to go back to something you said just earlier, you know, growing up, I, I also used to watch uh, this old house. And when I would drive with my dad to go from different properties and projects that he was working on, we listened to uh, tick and tack, something like that. Like, an, Oh yeah, dude, the, the car yeah. talk. Yeah. Oh, car yeah. talk. So we classic. My dad hates, he never, ever, ever works on cars uh, and he listens to the podcast. So, you know, I don't know why we listened to that, but they were always on <laughs> and we listened to, we'd watch this old house. And I think it's really cool that you have that, that memory as a kid. And then recently you were just spotlighted on this old house's website. Was you, I? Uh, you had a spotlight on there. Wasn't, oh man, am I, I'm blowing it. Um, oh, if I was, a, that would be super cool. You, you had a, a maker interview. Oh, this is, this is old. This is not recently. But you had a maker interview with Johnny Brook of Crafted Workshop on this. Oh, was that their their house one thing? I think I did that at like WorkbenchCon a couple of years ago. I, I, honestly, I don't think I ever saw what came of that. So it, it was a really, it was a really, cool, <laughs> it was a really cool interview. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it, it was very nice, and it's it's like literally you scroll all the way down, and at the bottom is what was his name, Dave, the guy who is the face of this old house something like that he's right at the bottom but that was it's interesting so yeah it was definitely house one but it's it's on yeah. the front it was on uh 
the the Google search review went into this old house.com. So it's behind nice. a huge paywall, so they're profiting off of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I I I remember doing that. It was uh it was a workbench con, I think the first workbench con. And yeah, I don't I don't think I actually ever saw that. So it, it's a great one. That's awesome. It was a great read. It was, and I didn't watch the video, I just read the article, but it was a good one. It's yeah. pretty cool to see like, you know, you come first full circle that like you watched this and subconsciously now you're on their website. Pretty neat. It is definitely crazy. Like, cause I know like Jimmy Duress has had like the, their whole crew out to his shop and it, it's just weird to be even in the same like community as them potentially, you know? And like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it is definitely pretty wild thinking back, you know, like as a kid, TV was the, the people on TV were just, you know, they're, right. they're huge celebrities. And to me, yeah. I haven't had cable in at least 10 years. So yeah. the people on YouTube are are the next generation of that in, in my mind. So I agree. it's definitely pretty cool to, you know, in, in some way be a part of that. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just exciting too, because, you know, knowing that I was a little kid watching that content, I know there are a lot of kids watching this kind of stuff and, instead of playing Fortnite, maybe they're building a coffee table or whatever, you know, like, I think that's really yeah. exciting. Uh, because I, I definitely spent my fair share of time on computer and video games. And it probably would have been even better for me to be doing something with my hands. So yeah, yeah totally. it, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, there's so much that could go into that as well as I, I, I would probably bet that this old house has not gotten 61 million views in the past <laughs> four years, but yeah, yeah, let's just not go there. They made, but, it um, the last <laughs> they made it. They have a household name. So um, I want to talk about something else that you said, which was your mountain biking. You worked at a mountain bike shop. Now mm-hmm. you live in arguably like a Mecca of the East coast of mountain Definitely. biking. And so when did you, was it, was it when you started working at that or was it the love for like being outside and hobbies and, you know, mowing lawns to buy bikes? When did you start kind of that hobby? Yeah, I think I'm trying to think. I, I, I know my first like bike project was rebuilding my dad's like road bike from the seventies or eighties. It was like a steel frame Nishiki brand. And I tore the whole thing down. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and you know, it's an older bike. So to me, a lot more difficult because, you know, a lot of open bearings and things that like way harder to put back together. Like now everything's sealed up and all, you know, easy in my opinion than <laughs> the older stuff, but yeah, like, really got it powder coated. And I remember having to like strip the paint and like, it was a huge project for me and, and super cool converted to single speed. But, um, I think biking very much clicked with me because, you know, it's, it's very gear intensive hobby and, and mechanical and all that kind of stuff. And then also, uh, when I exercise, I don't really want to know that it's exercise. Like I want to, I want my exercise to be disguised as something else. So mountain biking was great for me because I could go do it. And it was, you know, obviously the adrenaline side of things kept it interesting and yeah, it it was was super fun. So I got into that, I guess, in college and then worked at the bike shop for a couple of years and it was super fun. I mean, it's, you know, I did some stuff in like the back end, like building bikes and stuff like that, but then also, you know, ran the cash register and stuff. So that was, you know, some of my early days of, of being a salesperson really. Uh, so I think that was a, a cool experience for me. Uh, and that was college, when I was going to Georgia State. Shops. Yeah. College bike shops were, were yeah. key. I love oh, yeah. college. I was a big bike guy, but it was like, I could do it myself, but like, it was just nice to have a place to go to have all the tools, especially when you're in college and either you can get some help, some you didn't know, or do that. Like, I mean, high value spot for Definitely. me, in college. I mean, especially on those big campuses. Like you said, you went to, to Georgia state, right? So it's like, you got big yep. campuses, a lot of bikes, you know, you see a lot of people, yep. a lot of stuff. So yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's a little sad because yeah. Well, yeah. So like now that bike shop doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it, it's interesting and that was, this was performance bike, which that's a big like chain, you know, it wasn't yeah. like some tiny little uh, mom and pop thing. So all gone. Yeah. Oh, they, they, uh, 
as far as I know, they went bankrupt and, and closed. Because so. I bought I bought my tri, my first ever tri bike at a performance bike in Winter yeah. Park, Florida, and I went back like two years ago, and it's like a chiropractor. I was like, oh, I guess that one's yep. gone. But that's oh, interesting. They're all gone. Yeah, <laughs> and that's you know, I think that's the uh, the the other side of the coin with all the the internet stuff that we've yeah. been talking about. It's 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 tough, you know. I I I think local retail is obviously super important with a lot of this stuff. So, um, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of crazy, well, but yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Well, we also, I mean, you you talked about your love for music. You kind of started out with the love for music, and you know, now you you know, I mean, you got a passion for music. Do you know where that passion for music came from? Like. I mean, there was pretty much always music playing in our house or you know obviously when we were driving in the car that kind of thing and it was uh it's funny because my parents my mom and dad have very different tastes in music I would say (laughs) and so that was kind of cool you know like listen to a ton of like Motown and old school country with my mom and like Rolling Stones and kind of new wave like Joe Jackson type stuff with my dad so very interesting you know to me, not very similar taste of music, uh, but I think that merged for both my brother and I to where we just have, you know, super wide, uh, varied tastes in music. And my brother and I both play guitar and my parents actually play, they've started playing instruments like kind of as we got older uh, in high school and college, my dad plays banjo and my mom plays dobro. And so it's just super fun. It's it's one of those things in my family that's very much a, you know, a bonding point really is to be able to play music together and talk about music and it's uh it, it's super fun. So yeah, and, and that's kind of like what we look at. It. I mean, how many guitar builds do you have, you know, right now? Yeah. Yeah. Got quite a few of them. Yeah. Well, and I, it's honestly I do it more, but I don't <laughs> I don't want to become like a guitar builder channel. It's it's tough to like Yeah be a generalist in in this kind of you know channel um because i could totally go way down the rabbit hole with that stuff because i mean like this guy's only making guitars now like what's going on yeah (laughs) yeah a bunch of banjos it's getting crazy (laughs) yeah well and that's kind of been the balance but but yeah i I would love to do more and and plan to do more um i know like crimson guitars they're doing this um great guitar build off or whatever that they do every year and so I think I'm going to do something with that this year as well. Uh, but the acrylic guitar, right? Because you did the cement. Yeah. Did you ever do the, did you ever no. finish the acrylic? It's, I- uh, it's sitting in my shop. Well, the casting did not go so well. So, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, that was when I was out in Joshua Tree. Things were a little bit rushed. Uh, you know, I was severely wounded from my one wheel fall and uh, there was also plenty of extracurricular drinking and hanging out. And, you yep. know, it's like, oh, it's 10 o'clock. Let's do an epoxy pour, you know? And it's like, <laughs> right yeah, yeah. So it is very bubbly and a little bit yellow. So uh, yeah. I could definitely finish it, but, and I've still got the mold, so I could definitely do it again. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it would be fun. That that concrete guitar, man, that was, that was a, a 119 one. pounds is just I, but the coolest thing is you come up with it creative, yeah well so the main thing was because we were going out to, to joshua tree to, to bend in their the, the maker ranch and i knew that i wasn't gonna have access to like my typical tools you know like like a cabinet saw and, and planer and jointer and all that kind of stuff so i was like well what's something that could be like fairly simple that I could accomplish and like Quickrete was the brand who was like, you know, paying for some of our travel and stuff like that. So I was like, Oh, you know, I've, I've kind of been wanting to do some funky guitar material stuff. Like the Burl's art guy, obviously yeah. has been crushing in that space. And I think it's super cool. Like it, it just, it's exciting what he's doing. And I've always thought the whole tone wood thing was BS anyway. So I was like, well, I could make a concrete guitar and it was basically like an arts and crafts project you know like i needed essentially like a hot glue gun to to do what i did out there so it was perfect for me because i've done a handful of collaborations and every time it usually ends up being super stressful because we're like trying to get things done 
before the end of our trip and like the first couple of days we're like super chill and like just hanging out and talking for the most part and then the last three or four days we're like oh we actually need to build this and get it done <laughs> yeah and so I was like no I'm not doing that this time you know there's gonna be like 15 of us hanging out there I know there's gonna be a lot of getting sidetracked so it was kind of hilarious because I I think I worked maybe like an hour a day while I was there like because day one I was like oh well I guess I'll make this mold and so got some hot glue and some aluminum and you know made this little mold and poured the silicone and was like all right I'm done <laughs> and <laughs> then the next day I cast the epoxy body and that took all of 30 minutes so all right I'm done for the day because I gotta wait on this epoxy to cure and the next day I did the concrete and yeah so it was it was great. It was like super low key and I was helping everybody else with their projects and, you know, people were very stressed. Uh, like, like Mike Clifford from industrial maker and he did that crazy concrete ping pong table and it was like welded steel base and like, you know, four by eight concrete top. And he's like toiling away in the desert trying to pour all this concrete and I'm just sitting there on my laptop in the air conditioning. And, you know, so <laughs> it was, uh, it was a good move, I think. And then I waited forever once we got back home to actually finish it. And yeah, the video did well. So that was, that was super cool. It's a really yeah. cool idea. Even, even like the, the, the greatest thing about that video, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but the videos that you come up with, you, you have very unique and creative processes that come out of it, like using the dowels in the concrete like that. I was that was thinking, fun. What are you going to use a Tapcon on a freaking like? And I was thinking the same thing. I was like, <laughs> how am I going to do this? Because, you know, especially with guitar hardware, it usually comes with these tiny little fiddly screws. And I'm like, I know I'm not going to be able to replace those with anything concrete related. So, yeah, I was like, well, I could use wood. And yeah, that, that worked out like incredibly well. Yeah. And the funniest thing is, that guitar actually plays extremely well and sounds awesome. Like it, it's terrible to play because it's very heavy, but and it's like, it's 19 pounds. It's not 119. Oh, was, okay, okay. That would be ridiculous. I was like, like, I, was like, that's, that's, I like, would barely be able to lift it. Rebar? Like what did you like? Put some <laughs> <in the back laughs> no. <of the> thing? <laughs> but still 19 pounds for guitar. That's about twice as much as any electric guitar would weigh. Even like a Les Paul, which is considered pretty heavy is like, sub 10 pounds for sure wow so but yeah so it's like a boat anchor around your neck so you definitely only want to play it sitting down and even then like your thigh gets kind of tired just from supporting the weight but it sounds awesome and it, it was, sounds like it exercise was, in disguise <laughs> yeah it, it, it's, it's perfect <laughs> it kind of just like do that. a gig with the concrete guitar and i'll be uh hitting my numbers yeah it uh it was pretty ridiculous but yeah that, that was that was a fun one so it's gotta be i, I definitely has anybody else made one of those? Not that I've seen. I mean, when I was researching the concept of a concrete guitar, I saw, I think like one other guy had done something in that kind of vein. Um, but for me, like the silicone was the, the really fun part of that because I had never worked with that material. And I, I know that like a ton of people do some really cool like mold making stuff with silicone. And it's just a crazy material. Like it doesn't stick to anything. And like the silicone I used is really nice. It was stuff that Ben had on hand. It's like 250 bucks for like a gallon. And so I could make, you know, 50 concrete guitars with that same mold if I wanted. And uh, so it, it, I don't know, that was just a lot of experimenting and way outside of my comfort zone, which is always fun to me. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe we'll get some more requests for those, but they got to pay for shipping because it's <laughs> dude. No, I'm not. That's the thing. Like, you know, like, no, I don't want that. Some people will offer to pay me for stuff to build them stuff. I'm like, no, I, I like, unless I can make a video out of it at this point, um, yeah. I'm not going to do it. You know, it just, my living is not like I'm, I, I play a woodworker on YouTube is, is kind of how I describe it. You know, it's, it's what I do, but it's really the content that is the, the business. So it, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Like I, I'm pretty sure most of my family doesn't really understand, like not my immediate family, but like, you know, like my cousins and stuff, like 
I don't think they understand how I make a living. You know, it's like, so do you sell your furniture or? No, I just well, sell it. You want I to don't. It over here. <laughs> yeah, I make it for myself and then I make a video about it. So it's, it's a I weird mean, thing. There, there's different ways. I mean, what I like is like, I mean, even with the guitar things, like I think people are really, you know, I think people are getting kind of tired of just like mass produced stuff. So you want yeah, something that's totally. a little more unique. It could be kitchen knives, cutting boards, tables, chairs, whatever, guitars, you name it. Like somebody wants something custom. So there's something to be said about that. And um, it is nice that you don't have to produce a, a ton of uh, concrete guitars, but um, it's, yes. it's nice to see that people are like taking interest to it, right? That's what leads people to watching those things. Yeah. Well, and that's, I think, what got me into it really is, you know, before it was Crafted Workshop, it was Crafted Magazine. Let's, I'm going to yeah. pause you there. I yeah. don't want to be too far ahead of ourselves because we're, that's coming up real soon. So before we get there, I want to talk about one step before that, because you did, you did attend college. So you went to Barry College and then you graduated from Georgia State University in 2010 with a BA in computer information systems. Um, yes. But at Barry College, you studied TV and radio. So I wanted to like talk about getting to there. So you're, you're, uh, is that you were, yeah. Like how, how did you get to Barry college? I get, I guess I understand it now because it's in Georgia, not far from home. You go yeah. to Barry college, but why did you choose to study TV and radio? Well, uh, I think it was really the, the whole music side of things. I mean, I, I have been passionate about music for, for such a long time. And I ended up at Barry cause my wife got a soccer scholarship there. So I, I followed her there. We were high school sweethearts. So I was a year behind her. So she was already there. And so I was like, well, I'm definitely going to Barry. And so, you know, I, I wanted to be kind of that morning. Like I remember growing up, especially in high school, every morning I would listen to this 99 X in Atlanta, which was this like kind of like rock radio station. And they had an awesome morning show. It was like you know, a couple guys sitting around talking, playing new music, you know, interviewing artists going to shows uh, that sounded like the ultimate Not dream job sense. yeah so like well I guess I'll do that and so that was kind of my initial thing I also did some like video editing stuff in high school like our school news uh, I, I kind of managed that my senior year of high school I learned how to use Final Cut Pro my senior year and did kind of like a little internship with like a local editing company so kind of figured out video editing then. And so I was like, all right, TV and radio, that seems like a general category that would be good for me. Uh, and this was, I graduated in 06. So this was like 2007. And it was just the worst possible time to get into either of those industries, in my opinion, because, you know, like the Napsters and, and, and iTunes and things like that were, you know, the music industry was imploding, TV, I mean, I was already not really watching cable as much. YouTube was definitely a thing at that point. And so it was a really weird time. A lot of what was being taught in school was super outdated. So that was a little difficult. So I actually changed from TV and radio to music business because I was like, okay, well, I could work at a studio and, and kind of do you know something like that. That would be a little bit maybe more viable. But then again, music industry kind of imploding. Yeah. Like, well that's kind of weird yeah I was like well I also like I want to have a family at some point I don't want to be sitting in a studio at 3 a.m you know every night that that seems unrealistic so what's something that will make me money and IT was was that thing that was like close really closely related to you know computer stuff that I was already into and it was pretty easy major transition for me based on the classes I already taken so uh, definitely not the the passion uh, side of things necessarily, but you know, I, I got my college degree. I, For function meets passion, right? Well, yeah, well, our passion in this sense. It's yeah. strange how that kind of like it kind of blends together, though. With I mean, when when we you know move forward a little bit and talk a little bit more about that, like how it all kind of it it does kind of come full circle. I mean, the IT stuff was totally useless in my current job like because i was learning like microsoft access and stuff so literally never used that software since i graduated i've never managed any databases since i graduated so well yeah because you know. when you graduated that's like the next point i want to bring up like you start 
you become like a marketing social media person for a cigar company. Yeah. So, so during so you're college, like, you got the IT degree. Yeah. Well, <laughs> barely. So really, <laughs> well, during I mean, college, listen, was, you, got, you got the plaque, right? That's all. It, I know. did. I did. Yeah. yeah that, my GPA is not listed on there. Thankfully, you know, it doesn't <laughs> say BBA two point eight. You know, it's uh, it's you know, just that I got the degree. Yeah. But if you that get was degrees, man. But yeah. then you then, then what then what happens? Because then you know, obviously maybe there's like a you know a month or two, or I don't know how quickly did you get this job and how did this come about and like what you know. Cigar so I That's actually crazy. got the cigar job before I even graduated, really, right. um, which is kind of funny. Uh, so during college, I started my first blog, and it was on cigar reviewing. And so I would review cigars. It's called the Weekly Cigar. I would review one cigar a week. And uh, we had a great, great cigar shop in, in Atlanta. And it was like super cool place to hang out, puff and stuff, if anybody's in the Atlanta area. Uh, so, you know, especially for me, like in high school and college, like I wasn't like the big drinker, partier kind of person. So the cigar shop was a great place to go hang out because, you know, it was just hanging around, talking with people and, and just relaxing. And so... Yeah. There was also this huge amount of information in the cigar world about, you know, what country is this tobacco exactly. grown in? What what it was varietal of seed? You know, all, all the crazy minutia of cigars was really interesting to me. <clears throat> so, yeah, I got into cigar reviewing, and my wife got into grad school in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale area. And so when we moved down there, that's like cigar mecca. That's yeah. where like pretty much any country or any, any company that's based in the U.S. that's cigar related is either in Miami or Tampa. So nice. I was like all of a sudden in this area where like every cigar company was having events and all the owners were there. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I went to a, an event for Drew Estate, which was the company I, I ended up working for and met the owner, Jonathan Drew, and uh, they had a flash website that was extremely outdated. They had yeah. zero social media presence. And I was like, listen, man, I really think this would be helpful for you guys. And so I was 21, had not graduated yet. I still had like two classes left that I was taking online to finish out my degree. And uh, they hired me. And yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, because I was basically the only person in the company who knew anything about social media for the most part, like in those early days. And so I could do whatever I wanted because nobody knew what the hell Facebook was. Nobody <laughs> knew how to create a blog or any of that stuff. They weren't paying attention to the, the other cigar review bloggers who I had kind of, you know, yeah. figured out who they were and, you know, become friends with because I was doing that. Um, so it was, it was great. I mean, I was 21 smoking cigars at my desk and, and I started like cigar pairings. And so I was, getting paid to drink and smoke at my desk. I was like, well, this is it. I've, I've made it, you know? So that was, uh, <laughs> still that out. was it. It was pretty great. You know, it was pretty great. That's awesome. But uh, yeah. I was still working for somebody else. And I think at the end of the day, I really wanted to be my own boss. So yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. That's, that's a pretty cool story though. I mean, I like that. It's funny how you go from that. It, every, cause everything you do, in a way kind of leads us to a little bit about where we are right now. Right? Definitely. It's kind of like all of it kind of, all these pieces come together. They get us to kind of where we are here. And it, you know? and it actually starts with another crafted uh, yep. story, crafted magazine, which uh, I want to talk a little bit about like, first off, you know, why the choice of magazine when all of the content you were creating was strictly online as well as when when did you determine okay it seems like you have a very good business acumen and you you, you understand the steps that you're taking so when did you decide like i'm going to change my name from business or, or <laughs> business magazine uh crafted <laughs> magazine <laughs> crafted magazine to crafted workshop yeah uh so so crafted magazine started while i was still working for drew estate and it was kind of like a little passion project as I said, I'm a serial hobbyist. So get into everything I get into, like kind of to the most ridiculous extent. So uh, I was wanting to do something 
on the side, you know, just to kind of be a creative outlet. Um, and so I was like, okay, what's one kind of common thread of, of a lot of the hobbies I have? And it's like, well, I guess like handmade, you know, like made with, with love, made with passion, uh, that kind of thing. And so that's where the kind of crafted magazine thing came about. And I, I don't really know why I guess I called it magazine, maybe because it sounds more legitimate uh, than crafted blog. Um, yeah. But so back then I had, there was this app platform that I could like upload articles to and it would be an app on the app store, you know, Android or, or iTunes um, and you could subscribe and, and the whole deal. So it, it, it felt very much like a digital magazine. And so that was kind of the format I went after. I, I did uh, bi-monthly. So every other month um, had, you know, six or seven articles in each one usually kind of showcasing some cool uh, maker of some kind. So when that really kind of got going, we were living in New England. So I did articles on like companies in Maine making amazing like leather boots and craft breweries and coffee roasters and, you know, instrument and speaker manufacturers and, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, it was very much like it ended up kind of being, I guess, like a men's interest type of thing because I guess I'm a guy and that's the stuff I'm into, but it was all centered around kind of handmade, you know, kind of made well type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but then when we moved to North Carolina, we moved from a thousand square foot apartment to a like 2,200 square foot house. And we didn't have any furniture, uh, especially for our outdoor like patio space. So I was like, well, you know, I, I know a little bit about woodworking just from growing up around it some and you know, I can, I can Google and watch some YouTube videos. So before we even like moved to our house, I had already ordered a Ryobi miter saw because Anna White, her plans were like, they were the golden ticket to this whole thing. Cause they were just so well laid out and simple and, you know, just really easy to, to replicate. So um, my first YouTube video on woodworking was on building a solid core door workbench I was squatting on the floor of my garage with like almost no tools. And that was kind of how it all got started. And that video ended up doing better than most of the other videos I had posted on the crafted magazine channel at that point, which were like, you know, reviews of like an Arcteryx jacket or like, you know, coffee or whatever. Um, and because clearly there's a big woodworking scene on YouTube and like, well, maybe I'll start doing more of that. And little by little, I was like, well, maybe I should do only that. And that was when I decided to kind of rebrand as Crafted Workshop, not only because I was like super interested and super passionate about the woodworking side of things, but the community was just awesome. I mean, there was so many great people that I talked to when I was first getting started with that stuff. I mean, I had, I remember I, when I, quit my day job to do crafted which was still crafted magazine at that point um i set up a call with bob from i like to make stuff and then david Picciuto from make something and then matt cremona and talked to all three of them individually and kind of tried to pick their brains about how do you do this for a living and uh yeah that was that was really when things kind of kicked off and I quit way earlier than I probably should have. Uh, I, I think I had like 5,000 subscribers or something. I'm definitely not making like any real money. Um, but I had the day job while my wife was in grad school. And so she basically just woke me up one day and was like, you should quit. You should do this because like, I think you can do awesome. it. And so that was, uh, I put in my two weeks notice that day. And so. awesome. isn't it crazy that the smallest purchase, right? This Ryobi miter saw. Yeah. I was at Home Depot. I'm literally, I want to buy one because, you know, yeah. I have my dad's old miter saw and, you know, what, a $219 purchase can yeah. change your entire life. And so yeah. minute. It's, it's amazing. I was sitting in Boston and ordered it and had it shipped to my in laws so they could bring it to me when we moved to North Carolina. <laughs> like, that's how it was. Like, literally, I was, I had never touched a miter saw in person, probably and was just like all right well this is it i'm gonna do this and yeah it's it's crazy to think about how uh how important that decision was in my life and and you're one of the 
one rare channel where you have said to me, you said right now, like that video, because I watched, I always go back and I watch the first like 10 videos of someone. And that video that you just described of buying that, first off, you bought the, I think you bought the um, doors on Craigslist for $10. Yep. And you were talking about it and you're saying, you can get these, they're pretty cheap. Anyone's getting rid of them. And, And most people hide those videos. Yeah. But I love the fact that, that that truly is the beginning of Crafty Workshop. And you, yeah. you you don't give yourself enough credit because that really is, it was still pretty great content. I liked it. I mean, it like, was great. my videos have changed, but Organic. at the end of the day, they're pretty damn similar to what to what that video was. Like the, yeah, very much. The essence of what my videos are now was definitely there. And I mean, it. I think because I had done some video editing stuff and because I'd watched a lot of other channels at that point, like that, that solid core workbench was Matthias Wandel's exact design. Like I was completely exactly replicating that. So like I'd watched one of his stuff, Mike from Modern Builds, Bob from I Like to Make Stuff, Dave Bacciuto, Matt Cremona, obviously Wood Whisperer. I mean, obviously like tons of his stuff. So, and the you know, the, Taylor. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, yes. And then Norm, you know, like, yeah, really, if you look at some of this stuff, it's, it's not that far from Norm. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of wild, but yeah, it's, there was plenty of other people to kind of emulate to, to get started there. And, and I definitely, definitely did that. Yeah. So That's, I, I think it's a uh, going from like an apartment to a house for a serial hobby for a serial hobbyist is such an enablement move. Oh man, it's ridiculous. But and I mean, like, you just, cause you just, your mind just starts spinning. Like, I think about that now living in Seattle. Oh, yeah. I'm like, when I, when we get a house, like it's going to be crazy. I have so many projects coming up. What was that like there's when you were a, like, there's make, you make, make the, make the purchase delivered to his house the day he moves in. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be on the driveway the day he pulls up <laughs> closing. hundred <laughs> um, percent. Yeah. Sorry, like, okay, yeah. did you, I mean, you get the miter saw, you get all that stuff. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Did you already kind of have a catalog in your head of stuff you wanted to buy? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, like that weekend we moved in, my dad and I built a pair of Adirondack chairs based on Anna White's plans. We still have them. They're great. We still use them very regularly. And then my father-in-law and I, who also does woodworking stuff, like (laughs) more on the like huge awesome decks and like did this amazing cedar patio like crazy thing uh so him and i had built a standing desk because i needed one for this new house we were in and so like it was just immediately like all in on this stuff as soon as we moved because and that was the other i think real kind of tipping point is that we had this ridiculous garage like it was like 25 by 40 which is just insane as a normal garage for people like like that's it was just destined to become a wood shop you know so that that was a that was a huge kind of kick to to get going on that stuff and yeah it's it's just gotten bigger and bigger from there to where now i have a separate shop base shop shop space from our house and i'm looking at an even bigger shop space and yeah it's 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 kind of crazy Wow. Well, and you just keep building your own stuff. So it's like, you're like, oh, I kind of want yeah. that. I'll build it and make a video of it. <laughs> it's a great, yeah, I mean, w- it's a great model. Yeah. Well, and then we moved houses, you know, like, uh, I guess like three years ago now. And that was great because it's like, well, there's all these new projects, you know, because like in our yeah. old house, it's like, well, I've kind of built the stuff I need and I know we're going to be moving. So I don't want to do a lot of home improvement stuff, but now we're going to be here for a while. So it's been... It's been yeah, great. That's, awesome. that, that's uh, my biggest tip to any <laughs> aspiring YouTuber. If you're a woodworker, just move. You'll, <laughs> you'll have lots of new projects. Well, I think promise. Mr. Build It and you have done a similar, because he was on the show as well, and he he, he just bought a house to renovate. Yep. And yep. Uh, you are building a home from scratch. So like when you when you run out of the projects in the house, you have to find, you know, you, you did your shop build, you're doing all these yep. kind of things. And so how with the creative process, right? You can always walk around the house and say, this is here, here are 10 videos I can do right now. What happens when they're done? How far in advance are you, are you planning those videos? Yeah. Uh, I would say usually I'm probably two to three months out 
planning wise, just because it, it's it's a weird thing when you want to try to make a video out of it because you need to figure out obviously what the project is, but then hopefully the sponsors that are going to go along with that. So that's, I think the thing that requires a lot of pre-planning because, you know, a lot of these companies, like if you're going to put out the video in a week, they're going to be like, well, sorry, you know, <laughs> we, we can't do anything that quickly. So, uh, you know, the farther out I can be planning wise, the better uh, and the sponsor side of things. Um, but really the, the, like the, the not so tiny house was, more out of necessity than anything else. So, you know, we, we live in the house we live in. We just had our second kid. So for our guests, like this is the guest bedroom. And I built the dual Murphy beds for this. And like, this is our bonus room. And so I've got a bunch of videos on kind of renovating this room, but it's still one bathroom for both of our kids and our guests. So, you know, obviously that's certainly doable, but like if my parents want to come up and stay here for a couple of weeks, that would be not as fun, you know, like every night at 5 PM having bath time and stuff like that, you know, like the, the, the bathrooms get pretty crowded. Yeah. Um, so that's realistically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the tiny house was in a lot of ways, a, a house for them uh, or for really any of our guests to come, but then also like, I've always wanted to, to learn more on the construction side of things and do a house start to finish. I, I think that's like a huge like feather in my cap. Like once I'm done with this to be able to say, I've built a house, even like, it's a small house, but most of the things you would do in a regular house, I will have done. And so it was yeah. just, yeah, exactly. So Especially that was a great, but many many people claim I I built that house like yeah I, even even you know many of my parents friends oh yeah we built the house but they didn't actually build it you no. actually did everything on the house yeah and I've I've definitely certainly had plenty of help um, I know the Perkins brothers have been on y'all show they were yep. and and have and are hugely I mean there's probably not three days that Eric and I go without talking on the phone. And usually I'm asking him questions about building a house and he's like running ideas by me on the YouTube side. So it's, it's been this great symbiotic relationship where, you know, like I've kind of done the YouTube like business side of things a little longer than he has. And obviously he's been building houses for way longer than I ever have. So it's been, uh, it's been a really cool relationship to have. Yeah, and they're great people. I love their story. Yeah. So it's so oh. interesting because they both went totally different paths and they, Ended up point right back yeah. together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're awesome, man. And they yeah, did. Yeah, they're fun dudes. The first remote, fully remote podcast, literally on the on the set, on the not set, on the build of the house. Oh yeah. Currently in the on back the mountain. Yeah, in the mountain, in the in the front two seats of their Ford F one fifty pickup truck. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> this, this is spot on for you guys. So they live it, man. That's yeah. uh, they work their butts off it's it's uh yeah they're 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 great dudes and we had a ton of fun it was a real bummer when we we got the i mean it was very exciting but also a bummer when we got the roof sheathing on and like got the building dried in and then you know my wife was due like three days later so yeah. we were not going to be working together anymore anytime soon and i was like man i'm gonna miss working with these guys every day because it's, it's tough to do this kind of work and maintain like a super positive attitude all the time because there are obviously mistakes and, you know, difficult things that come up, you know, like when I was, we were doing the floor framing, I tried to get way too much lumber in my truck and bent my tailgate and had like lumber dragging on this huge road near our house and like had to stop at the Chick-fil-A parking lot and like unload half of it in the bushes there and like take it home and it was horrible, but somehow like Eric kept, kept like this super upbeat, you know, mentality the whole time. And, and that, that was saving grace. Cause if it was me by myself. I would have been just losing it. So but he's been yeah. doing it. Like we talked about this earlier. He's been doing this for yeah so long that, you know, he knows no project is perfect. No project yeah. is going to go to plan. There's going to be something that's going to pop up. You, you have to take it in stride and you can't because yeah it's like we talked about before we started recording today is like the second you start a project right you open up one wall that project oh, yeah. has gone totally a different direction so 
Yeah. Yeah. You, especially if you're doing something for the first time. Yep. Like take any estimate you have for how long it's going to take and double it. Like just right off the bat, because it's going to take at least that, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's so ridiculous. Let's talk a little bit about the channel itself. So you you, you quit your job at five thousand subscribers, right? Like that is yeah. a that is an extremely amazingly bold and awesome move. Um, five thousand subscribers five years ago though was a totally different YouTube game. You were instantly yeah. You know, you're you're you've been doing this for a while. So you you quit at five thousand. What does it feel like to um? to get to like that 100,000? What was that like? Or even 10, 15, 30, 100,000 subscribers. What was that What was that feeling to you? It was great. I mean, you know, I, I think it's just really cool to see all the work you put in kind of come to fruition, you know, because in those early days, especially, it's really hard because you're like, the videos didn't take any less time. They, they took more time back then because I, I wasn't as comfortable with what I was doing. And like, very few people were watching them. So that's very discouraging, you know, especially as somebody who is aware of the other popular channels and seeing the kind of numbers they might be getting and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and comparing yourself against them. That's tough. So yeah, I think all those milestones were great. I know like when I had done one year full-time, like we had a big party and uh, like we all we all built birdhouses. So I had like, you know, 15 <laughs> people over and like we paired off in groups of three in my shop and we all built birdhouses. And I, I crowned the, the best birdhouse with like a laser cut metal and, you know, it was super fun. So I, I've definitely tried to appreciate the milestones along the way. And, and it's, it's easy to get caught up, especially because we just constantly have to keep kind of putting out content. And that's yep. just kind of like the, the, the way, this all works it's easy to get caught up and not comparison is, comparison is tough back. though right oh oh yeah and because you see the other youtubers and you're doing it and you're like well you know am i ever going to get there you're not feeling good yep. like maybe you get a couple that that pop off and you get some good views yep. um when your first video hit one million views what was that like yeah that was crazy uh it's those videos are, are they're awesome but they're terrible because then any video after that, you're like, why is this one not oh. hitting 1 million? You know, it's like, <laughs> you just, you, like, well, that especially one just there. Yeah. Just did 1 million. Well, and YouTube is really in your face now with all of your metrics. So it's like, yeah. you've got the, the green up arrow or the red down arrow on everything, whether that's yeah. number of subscribers in the last month or your AdSense or your views or watch time or whatever. And so it is painfully <laughs> obvious whether your channel is trending up or trending down right and after those million view videos it will always be trending down by a huge margin because you're just not going to do that every week unless you just happen to hit on something that's like super successful so yeah. uh, they're they're tough you know it's it's amazing while it's happening and and terrible <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, now you have, you've got, you've got 10 videos now over a million. Uh, you got two yeah. that are really close. Um, I, yeah, I mean, they keep kind of climbing and it's, it's nice because people, the, I think the best thing about your content too, is like the older ones even still start to pick evergreen. Up. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Evergreen. Evergreen. You want to go back and it's like, you want to build a sweet, like ping pong table. Like yeah. you start, you know, typing that in, that's what you're going to pull up. Um, you want to redo a kegerator i watched that video <laughs> damn i need a kegerator you do need a kegerator i, do. I mean it's I it's very nice because like I, I can't imagine being like a daily blogger because basically once that day is over that video is dead for the most yeah. part you know yeah. like but what we do thankfully most not most but some of them will continue on over time and continue building and you know, especially with like AdSense type stuff, which, you know, is how some of your money is made on YouTube. That library of videos that, that keep chugging along is really what ends up building your business over the years. So yeah. it, it's funny because when I quit, YouTube AdSense was not part of the equation, like not at all. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll get paid by sponsors and my channel is never going to be big enough to like net any huge AdSense numbers. And it's still 
definitely not compared to like you know whoever jake paul or whatever the heck they're you know right. the, the big people you know yeah i, yeah, I don't exactly. watch any of those people i'm sure the they're far. not as much as you think they are well some they might yeah, yeah. i mean mr wow. beast is yeah well when laying you, it I, with adsense well, from a children's standpoint, you know, Coca Melon Man, that guy made like a hundred million dollars on YouTube ad since last year. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any videos that have surprised you? Like, do you have any, like, I'm just thinking, like, do you have any that you're like, I can't believe that there's this is getting that much traction on this video? Like, did you make something I mean, that you're like, I don't even, like, I don't know why, how, why or how it got the traction it got? They're honestly always a surprise because you That's do crazy. your best. I mean, some of them make a lot of sense, like, you know what I mean? But there's got to be some where you're like, yeah, this is actually like surprising the thing is i hope that everyone is going to do that and so like you 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 go out and look at the other videos and it's like okay well that that guy did you know half a million right. on doing something and i'm like well i'm gonna put out that video and maybe it'll do that and then it does like fifty thousand, you know so it's <laughs> it's like this huge like expectation and 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 disappointment thing on a lot of videos so any of the ones that end up doing that well are, are shocked to me. Like any ones that like I get more views than subscribers, that's like crazy to me. So, um, I mean, the home improvement stuff has been good, uh, generally speaking. And that's the ones that seem to have done the best for me. Evidently putting in flooring of any kind. That's, those are the ones that have like done super well for me. Laminate, tile, the hardwood one is, is ticking along. So I'm just going to put in more flooring, I guess. Yeah, but uh, I mean, that's, yeah. almost, that's almost 10 million views right there. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, I'm like my buddy Brad from Fix This, Build That. His his vinyl plank video, one of them is at that level. So like it, it's clearly those topics are very popular. And, and it makes sense because like that's like probably the greatest DIY project is yeah. – to put in some kind of flooring because it's you're going to save and thousands video, of dollars and every video makes it seem so easy <laughs> yeah and in yeah. reality it's terrible yeah. i would <laughs> never recommend doing tile ever like i i loathe tile with every fiber of my being i'm about to have to do a bunch of it in the tiny house but it's horrible work but uh i mean it saves you a lot of money. So yeah. well, that's another benefit. You know, that's why it's evergreen too. A lot of the stuff saves people money. They love to do it. They get the satisfaction of doing it themselves, whether it pisses them off or not. Like it's still an experience yeah. that they did and that they, you know, did that craft to. Um, so there's like a good lane for that. Then there's like, I look at, there's some other channels that I follow that like, it's literally just a guy like taking scrap wood and making like ASMR videos out of that. Have you seen that guy? Yeah. And he's I have probably, I don't, you know, there's different <laughs> lanes that people go down. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, that's the cool thing about YouTube is like you really just, I mean, it's tough when you like I consume a lot of YouTube, so naturally I'm gonna compare myself against some of the content I'm consuming, uh, but it would almost be better if I wasn't because then I could just be putting out these videos and they would be their own things. You know, I think I think that's the hard part, especially like because i think business side of things I, i'm very like focused on growth and that kind of stuff right that's where yeah. things get tricky right. but uh but yeah yeah so we we have a few subscriber questions which is like super fun section that we're adding um and i think they they ask a lot of questions that are interesting and not like canned like some stuff that J jp and i go through on our notes ahead of time so i'm gonna roll to that jp do you have any questions before we go there no i don't think so i mean i'll have some i'll have some coming up after this yeah I'm jp curious. jp has the last two questions and and, and one of I, them is like yeah i guess before we go into that what are you watching right now on youtube yeah <laughs> uh i've been going really <laughs> deep I love down the, like the home distilling uh okay. side of things so yeah, you know, I've, I've done the home brewing quite a bit. I've gotten out of it since having kids because it takes a ridiculous amount of time to, to brew beer. Trying to raise kids like, my yeast. Yeah, well, <laughs> dude, just doing an all-grain brew session, you're in like eight hours minimum, you know? Yeah. So that's a long time to be standing around a pot of boiling water, you know? Like it's yeah, it's it's hard to, uh, hard to justify, I would say, as yeah. a parent of small children. So 
So you the live home vicariously dist- through other channels. Well, I, the home distilling a little quicker. And I've got friends who are home brewers. Like that's what they do. They don't have any children. So that's great. And so they could brew the wash and then I could distill it in like two hours. And mm-hmm. it's all like, I'm looking at all electric. So it, I could do it at night, you know, not out in the driveway or whatever. So nice. anyway, I've been going deep down the rabbit hole. Of course, it's illegal in the United States to do that. So that's a weird thing. But there's a dude in New Zealand that's super into it. And it's, it's legal over there. So there uh, he can have a YouTube channel on home distilling and uh, You're in a historical exciting. for uh, for some moonshine. So I mean, it's ridiculous, man. It's yeah. like, I, I, I can understand you can, of course, endanger yourself doing this stuff. But if you do any research, I mean, there's no difference between that and, and brewing beer, in my opinion. So I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm not going to be starting a YouTube channel about it. But uh, and and yeah. my any still that I might own is just for decoration. Yeah, if absolutely. It comes to my garage just for looks, but <laughs> it's clearly a set drop. This is not yeah, just, new. Yeah. I just like the way a stainless steel still looks for, in my garage. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, if yeah. it if it's the the decor, so <laughs> I like that though. It, make, it that's a cool that's a cool transition. I, I understand the sentiment because eight hours. And it's not like you have to, you have to be watching it. You can't just go oh, yeah. eight hours and walk away. But with distilling, you can somewhat walk away because it, once it's processing, yeah. you can be like, hey, I'm going to go do something else, come back. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right, I have four questions for you. And then yes. we'll go to the final one. Um, so I'm going to start with Poland's Woodworks. Instagram names are tough, so, yeah. you know. Oh, sorry. I didn't even, yeah. I'm going to butcher someone's name. I guarantee it. And I apologize in advance. If I do, I'm sorry. I don't mean to do that. Um, so Poland Woodworks, how's the shop doing? And I think this is a great one because we talked a little bit about it. You give a little teaser there. Um, and then plans for a storefront. If so, will you have retail products on display? Yeah. Uh, the shop is very underutilized right now. It's, it's, kind of a shame because I mean really since October when I started this I've done almost nothing there uh woodworking wise I I have my office over there and that's where I record voiceovers and and do some editing stuff I've got an office here which is in our bonus room but yeah the, the woodworking side has been vastly underutilized actually one of the front windows got broken on Christmas Eve freaking idiots doing donuts in the parking lot and snowed here and kicked up a rock and broke a 10 foot by four foot panel of tempered glass. And so my woodworking at the shop was boarding up that window until uh-huh. it could get fixed, uh, which even that was kind of nice. Cause I was like using my festival jigsaw and stuff. Like it was like, Oh man, I missed this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I don't think I'll ever do retail just because I don't have stuff to sell, but I am potentially looking. So I rent my current shop, which was a big topic of debate when I did the like shop build out thing that I was like putting all this money into a rental property. I was like, well, I'm going to be here for years. I'm making money, making videos. I'm like, it, it's a no brainer. I might as well, but I would love to own whatever that shop space is. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking I've got a few properties that are kind of interesting. So we'll see what comes of it. Commercial real estate is insanely expensive. So that's, uh, I'm trying to figure that out, but yeah, it's, uh, and obviously the real estate market right now is for whatever reason, insane, even though I thought this was going to be like an economic downturn during COVID, but it's kind of the opposite. Like <laughs> real estate find is a place booming. Strip mall. Find a place Dude. with a strip mall because strip malls are, hurting i mean well that's what my current shop is right in. yeah but really? but i rent it if i could buy it i would stay there forever probably um but yeah i i'm i am in a strip mall but i also have just regular entry doors no roll top door so like loading in plywood and stuff is a pain in the butt um yeah there, there's there's some annoyances so and it's yeah. not things you can typically easily change on a rental property potential well yeah and like my rent is going nowhere like like i'm just throwing money out the window every month you know and like 
my rent is pretty cheap. It's like 700 bucks for 1500 square feet, which is dirt cheap for most people. Uh, it seems like for commercial space, but yeah, that's, I mean, think about like Boston, 700 bucks. Oh, dude. <laughs> you, can't it's even, ludicrous. you can't even get a garage. You can't even get but a parking space. It should be that cheap because the building yeah. is terribly maintained and like it was an empty concrete shell when I moved in. So, you know, it's like I, I had to put in like $13,000 of materials to get it to where it's at. Right. And it's nice where it's at, but I would love to, to own it. So then any improvements I make are on a property. I own. Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. So then uh, Jake, 0070000. Oh, it's pretty easy. I got that one, I think. Uh, what type of wood do you use to make furniture with? And I think this is a broad question, but, uh, you know, let's just be like indoor versus outdoor table. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big one. I mean, I was using a lot of walnut for a while. That was kind of like my go-to, I would say. I got a really good deal on Craigslist on some roughs on walnut. And then I went through all of that and then walnut got stupidly expensive. <clears throat> so I've been using a lot of ash lately because ash is pretty cheap because of the emerald ash borer. Unfortunately, a lot of ash trees have to be taken down. So ash is kind of widely available. Um, I've been using a lot of oak lately too. I, I'm digging that kind of like black stained oak kind of look. Uh, you still get that nice grain pattern, but it's kind of neutral looking. Um, for outdoor, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, I built some planters that were cedar. Um, I built a huge dining table that was Ipe. So it really kind of depends on the application and how much money you want to spend. Um, Ipe is insanely expensive. Uh, so that that's highly dependent on how much money you want to spend. But yeah, th those are probably the woods that I use, I would say, most frequently. That makes sense. Dumb question for me for being in the South. Isn't Cypress, do people use Cypress? For Cypress is good. Yeah, I've used Cypress uh, uh, actually a decent amount. Yeah, it's uh, it's great for rot resistant. It's super soft. So okay. it's a little annoying while you're working with it. Like I built, uh, built some Adirondack chairs out of Cypress and then a kayak rack. And it's it's so easy to dent it. Like if you, if you are not careful when you're moving around during finishing and stuff, like you'll end up with dents in your finished project, which is kind of annoying to me, but yeah, it's great. It's, it's like super, super resiny. So it will kind of gum up your, your machines a little bit and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, that's one of the woods we are able to get here pretty easily in North Carolina. It's, I guess, grown mostly in Florida. Yeah, at least around here. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely pretty available. So Jackson, this is a good kind of segue from tools that you said. Uh, Jackson Thomas asked, what tools were surprisingly handy when building your not so tiny house? I mean, I would say number one thing, all battery powered. So you know, the, obviously the, the traditional thing is to run a compressor for a lot of your, especially nailers and stuff like that. So for the most part, we were all battery powered. And because this is in the middle of my backyard, I don't have really a power source besides an extension cord. Uh, running a compressor would have been a little more annoying. Plus then you're dragging around hoses and all that stuff. So I know like the Perkins guys had not used a battery powered framing nailer before working on my house. And I mean, Eric's face was just like <laughs> mind blown. You know, it was just ridiculous how easy it is to, to move or that around, you know, all of the I'm walls. And, stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and, well, and, and, and the clip it has it has an awesome like clip that you can literally just hang it on your belt and just walk around yeah. uh, kyle from r and r builds billings yeah like, he is a huge uh oh, frame, yeah. you know, battery powered frame you know, guy yeah yeah it's it's interesting you know like it, it in the construction world it seems like you've got like the two kind of schools of thought like the the, the old school guys are going to continue using what they've used and and there's definitely a slight speed advantage on pneumatic. I mean, there's just no getting around that. Like when we were putting on the, the floor sheathing, like 
they were using their fast load pneumatic nailer and it's insanely fast how many nails you can put out with that thing but the convenience side it's like if you're not framing houses for a living or if you're going to build in that little extra time it, it's it is very convenient so uh yeah I, I would say generally battery power tools have been awesome um i've been fortunate in that like i work some with dewalt and, and craftsman and, and they're the same parent company and so i've i've gotten some of the more specialized tools for some of this stuff like especially the specialized nailers so like roofing nailer, framing nailer, siding nailer, you know, like all the nailers. And it definitely makes things go a lot quicker when you're using the right tool. And, and I've always been like a big uh, proponent of investing in your tools. And I think a lot of people get frustrated and end up quitting these kind of hobbies because they're unwilling to spend the money on the tools and are using a crappy version that ends up not working very well and makes it seem way harder than it should be. Uh, yeah. Like I, I don't shop at Harbor Freight for the most part. I, I, I just, I don't think saving 20 bucks is worth using an inferior tool. So, uh, you know, fight Especially me if, if that. Long haul, you know, if you're <laughs> yeah. doing improvement after improvement, you know. Yeah. I just, I, you're just going to piss yourself off the whole time. Well, and if that tool breaks and you have to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the real version, you've just wasted all of that money and your time having to go out and buy more. Like, I, I don't know, like, like time is the most valuable resource for me. So I'm, I'm very willing to invest to, to save time, you know? Yeah. So, Do it right the know. first time. I mean, that's the sentiment of my, my dad taught me not to first. Yeah. Might as well just do it right. Yeah. Buy one, try one. Don't half ass two yeah. things, whole ass one thing is how my parents. Yes. <laughs> Freaking uh, Ron Swanson, baby. Yeah. Oh, man. What oh, he's it? legendary. I mean, come on. Let's talk about like. Oh. He's the fact that he really real is woodworking like a, like world, a master craftsman. Like woodwork is great. Yeah. Yeah. He has a be friends. beautiful mustache, too. Yeah. Nick is, Nick is the you man. Could, you could, uh, yeah, smoke. You could smoke cigars and probably drink whiskey with the. Uh, yeah, Nick Offerman for a while. I would love to. I've got a giant Ron Swanson poster in the in the bathroom in the shop. So every time I go oh, sure. pee, well, it's all all the quotes just right well, there. But, you, yeah. you should oh, exactly the call right now. Amazing collaboration. Yeah, that needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, crafting that would be great. And uh, the OG of crafting yeah. in a workshop. That would yep. be great. Um, last question uh, is based on where you are in Asheville, um, and it's from. AKK AK Kalib. I'm um, sorry, I told you I was gonna butcher one. Um, and they ask, being in Asheville, what's your favorite food spot, and why is Burial Brewer the bees? <laughs> so yeah, Burial <clears throat> Burial is probably my favorite brewing uh, brewery here in Asheville. Uh, they are definitely amazing there's a lot of choices here though like Asheville is a huge craft beer scene as I guess I guess we were talking about that before we started recording but yeah, yeah. there that's one of my favorite parts about living here is just you know the, the, the beer scene and, and the outdoor scene is great um, food spots I mean there's a bunch COVID has obviously made all of that kind of weird but I would say Curate is my favorite restaurant here so you're visiting Asheville, get reservations like four months ahead of time because they're super booked out, but excellent Spanish tapas kind of style. That's okay. There's a yeah. uh, there's a beer when I visited Charleston is where I had it. I didn't I didn't know if uh, when I was in Raleigh Durham area if they had it there, but um it's called One Claw. I could only find it in South Carolina. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. love that beer. And I can't, I can't find it. I gotta figure out how to ship it. I gotta figure that out because I love that. Yeah. Yeah, Charleston's awesome, man. I, I I've spent some time over there. Uh, it's I guess not super close. It's like five hours from here, but uh, I've got some friends over there. Ashley Harwood, uh, she's an awesome wood turner, and uh, a friend yeah. of mine, Charlie, who's a woodworker over there. But yeah, they've got incredible food scene and and great beer scene as well. So yeah, Charleston's awesome. Good stuff. Well, that that yeah. that concludes my questions. Um, JP, do you have any final questions? I don't. Um, I think we're good, man. That, yeah. So, 
and it's been awesome. This has been awesome. I'm gonna let JP roll us out before we roll out. Um, everything's in the in the bio or in the YouTube description. So make sure you check out his Instagram, uh, to Twitter. I mean, I have a Twitter, but I don't put it down there. I wouldn't say it's my most used medium. I still don't understand it. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to tweet out that we did this podcast. I don't know. <laughs> what um, but it, it'll be there as well as check out his, um, his, uh, YouTube channel. If you're not already subscribed and you don't know about him, it's amazing content. You will get inspired to do something in your home. Hopefully when you open up the wall, you don't find anything crazy and it's a very easy project for you. Um, and then, uh, make sure you check out his, uh, his uh, website and on his website you can find some project uh plans as well as some merch so check that out um yeah sorry i butchered that i'm so sorry that's terrible if you made it this well, here, far, we'll, let, we'll let him we'll let uh yeah, yeah. Let johnny do oh. this. So what we're gonna do here johnny is uh we're gonna crack open a beverage um and while we are drinking said beverage uh chugging it actually <laughs> want us to we want you to tell tell the people what you got going on, what your YouTube channel is, you know, what they can expect in the future and, um, you know, something to, to sign us out with. So once we crack right. these, we'll go ahead and get started and we'll go from there. Cheers. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, I'm building a house in my backyard currently. So subscribe to uh, watch all of that content unfold. I have pretty much finished the outside of the house. I'm gonna be moving to the inside of the house into the not so tiny house on Crafted Workshop. Besides that, usually woodworking and home improvement. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good quality content. So you should subscribe. Excellent. Excellent. That's yeah, crazy, man. I've been Excellent sipping on this climbing. cocktail the whole time. So yeah. Excellent. Instead Ooh. of shotgunning Wait. beer, you should. I'm going to uh, drink this beer while I edit the podcast now. Oh, Cigar City, man. Nice. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Been Love there it. many times. Yeah. Johnny, thank you so much. Good yeah. Appreciate the time today. Yeah. Really great. This yeah, is really fun. I, I appreciate it. And thank you so much. I look forward to uh, maybe if we end up relocating into the, the Raleigh or Dude, Asheville yeah. area, we can uh, collaborate and you can help us build a studio. It would be cool. And then you can bring the Crafted Workshop podcast to be hosted there. We'll have yeah. Boom. Sounds good. Go. All right. Well, awesome. thanks, everyone. I uh, appreciate it. Johnny, this is awesome.